welcome to Agathos Ministries for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. I am Pastor Scott Conway, and today we are talking about Christmas as part of a, a three-sermon set. Today is Christmas, a story millennia in the making. Millennia in the making for Christmas. Now, we already know that God first hinted at the Christmas story to come in Genesis 3.15. The Christmas story... God's plan for the Christmas story had been set up from the very beginning. That when God created the heavens and the earth, he already knew that to God, all time is now. That means as soon as he creates this thing called time for us to move through in a linear fashion, to him, he already knows the beginning from the end. He's at the beginning, and he's at the end, and he's at every point in between. So from the moment God created Time From the moment God created the heavens and the earth, and we did the E equals MC squared thing last time, he knew he was going to have to do Christmas. He knew the moment he gave free will, he was going to have to do Christmas, he was going to have to do Easter, he was going to have to fix what his free-willed beings were going to break. Now, he just started to let us know in Genesis 3.15. That's when he was warning the serpent... But, of course, we have it recorded in the Bible. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. We talked last time about the odd structure of her seed. That women don't have seed. That phrase is not a typical biblical or Hebraic phrase. That the seed comes from the man. The womb is in the woman, saying that there's a seed from the woman would imply then by the structure of the language that there's going to be someone born that isn't going to have a man involved. And we talked about that last time, how God, the cosmic entity, the ultimate, the supreme, the being so huge, so vast, that he transcends galaxy after galaxy after galaxy. He is bigger than the universe because he created the universe that he manifested and put himself in a complete and total harmony to exist as a Y chromosome. So today we're going to talk about Daniel. Now there is a fascinating aspect of the Christmas story that actually starts with Daniel. Now most people know Daniel from Daniel and the Lion's Den. But most people know that that's the Daniel story. If you ask what people know about this person in the Bible named Daniel, they'll usually say something about, oh, wasn't he the, the lion's den guy? And then you know, he was fine and they didn't eat him or something like that. That's the story most people know. We also know about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, what does that have to do with Daniel? Well, that's from the book of Daniel. Not everybody knows that. Those are the three people that got thrown into the fiery furnace because they refused to bow down to the great golden idol that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But Daniel is almost certainly a key player in Christmas, too. And this is a part a lot of people don't know about Daniel. Now, what was Daniel's beginning? So that when he was a young man, he was taken captive to Babylon. You know, that wasn't any big surprise. A whole bunch of people were taken captive to Babylon because all of Israel and Judah got taken captive and got taken, taken off to Babylon for the great captivity. Now, Daniel and a few well-known friends that we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego became servants of Nebuchadnezzar. At Daniel 1.20, and there's a lot of stuff in here. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. That is pretty significant. Daniel... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were all friends with one another. They had been raised Jewish, Hebrew. They had been trained in the ways of the law, according to God. They'd learned the Torah. They learned what prophets had been around up until then. They had had their teaching. Daniel was the one that went to the supervisor of the slaves and told him that, you know, because of who we are, because of our religious beliefs, we're not allowed to eat this food. So I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. And Dan think about how much Daniel had to know about this. It's okay, of all this food you're spreading out before us, what we are allowed to eat of it is just the vegetables. So 
Just let us eat the vegetables. Now, keep in mind, the servant that works for Nebuchadnezzar, who's supervising these new slaves, is going to get in trouble if anything goes wrong with the inventory. And here is one of the members of the inventory shows up and says, we want to not eat all this good food. We want to eat just the vegetables. Now, this guy, he's never heard of such a thing. It's like, what? You're not going to eat the meat? You're not going to eat the cheese? What, what's all that about? No, 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 no. If you guys start getting all weak and emaciated, I'm in trouble. And the way Daniel uh, cut the deal is, we'll tell you what. Let us eat the diet the way we want to eat the diet. Check us in a week. If we're getting weak, if it's not working, we'll do it your way. Now, even just that deal. Think about the wisdom already showing in that deal. Basically, Daniel's saying, okay, trust me to handle this. I know what I'm doing. But I'm not just saying, just cut me loose and let me do whatever the heck I want. Let me explain. Test me on it. Check me out in a week and see how we're doing. Check us out week by week, day by day. If we're doing poorly, I take full responsibility for the outcome produced by my way. And if you'll give me the chance, I'll show you that my way really works. And if my way doesn't work, I'll do it your way already demonstrating a high level of wisdom, a high level of deal-making. Now, does that sound like a very reasonable deal? If you were the supervisor and you're, okay, well, I don't understand this thing. You seem to know what you're doing. You seem committed. You seem willing to put it to the test. You're basically coming to me and say, let me prove it to you. Like, okay. And if in a week it's not going well for you, then you promise you will do it my way. You will let me control every waking moment of your life. You will eat what I tell you to eat. You will do what I tell you to do. You will study what I tell you to study. We have a deal. Now, does that even sound like a good parenting deal? I mean, what if your child came to you and said, Mom, Dad, I have a deal for you. Let me handle school my way. Check me out in a week, especially these days with everything online. Check me out in a week. If I am not nailing it, I totally agree, I will do it 100% your way. How many parents would not take that deal? How many parents would go like, okay, I'm going to gamble one week of your homework on letting you try your thing? Okay. And, says, and furthermore, if I only get it good for a week, check me out the next week and the next week and the next week until the end of the school year, until I get my final report cards. If I can show you that my way works and that I can do my way on my own initiative as a leader of myself, can I have permission to keep doing it my way? How many parents would jump at that deal? How many slave supervisors would jump at that deal? This one did. The end result was in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them. Nebuchadnezzar gives them a quiz. Talk about a final exam. The king calls these people in front of him, and basically all of these servants who have been trained by the Babylonian scholars are being tested, and Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego demonstrate that they are ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. The magicians, the people that can do stuff that is supposed to be so spectacular that they're supposed to be having supernatural help. And these four guys are better than them. The astrologers, the ones that consult the heavens, they look at the position of the stars to tell the future, to be able to gain wisdom from the cosmos. And these four guys are better than them. Well, the result was that they got put in charge of stuff. Now, keep in mind, they're still slaves. But slaves back in those days, if you had an intelligent slave, you put him in charge of stuff. You just basically turned them loose. I mean, think about uh, Joseph and his multi or technicolor dream coat. He was put in charge of part of his house. That technically he's still a slave, but he's the slave and the general manager of the household. Later on, he got put in charge of all of Egypt, second only to the Pharaoh. But he's still technically a slave. Pharaoh can have him executed at any time. He can't quit his job, even though he's the number two most powerful person in all of Egypt. So Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel are still servants of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar then later has a dream. Now, he does something very, very strange here. Nebuchadnezzar demanded that the dream interpreters 
tell him what he dreamed. He says, I had a dream. I want the interpretation of the dream. And they go, okay, great, O king, tell us what you dreamed. He says, no, 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 no. I'm not going to tell you what I dreamed. You tell me what I dreamed, and you tell me what it means. Now, that's getting pretty serious. Now, I imagine, I mean, we don't have the entire internal monologue that Nebuchadnezzar went through, but I imagine at some point, after he had this dream, and it kept happening or recurring, and he said, okay, this, this is a dream that needs an interpretation. But, you know, I kind of get the feeling that these guys just sort of make stuff up as they go along. That they use the obvious symbolism, and they keep telling me this, and you know, it doesn't always work out the way they say. And you know, now that I think about it, if someone tells me what they dream, I could make up whatever the heck I wanted to tell them it meant. How do these guys know what they're talking about? They claim to be magicians, have access to all the vast supernatural power. They claim to be astrologers, that they have access to uh, the wisdom of the cosmos. They claim to be dream interpreters, that they get the supernatural contact with the gods beyond the veil of the land of dreams. You know, logically, if that's true, they should be able to figure out what I dreamed. And they got called on it. Well, the Chaldeans, the magicians, the astrologers, basically went to King Nebuchadnezzar. No, 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 nobody can do that. No, no king's ever asked that. You've got to figure there's a backstory that went on here that we don't know a lot about. The bottom line is they couldn't answer. They had no idea what he dreamed. Now, they already knew if we just show up guessing, I mean, we're going to get killed on the spot. So we've we got to figure this out, but they had no way to figure it out. The, their best course of action, what they kept trying to do, is to convince Nebuchadnezzar, no, king, you have to tell us what you dream. That's the way this works. Nebuchadnezzar said, no, I'm done with you guys, and ordered them all to be killed. So the execution orders go out. Now, whatever the capacity in which Daniel and his friends were working, they were on the hit list. Now, I don't know how these orders were executed in general. But when the guy shows up to pick up Daniel and his friends, Daniel goes, whoa, 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 hang on a second. What, what, what's the hurry? What's going on? So apparently Daniel wasn't part of some of those initial discussions. But he's still on the hit list anyway. So Daniel stepped up. Says, let, let, let me talk to the king. Just, just give me a second here. Just give me a second. Finds out what the king wants. And Daniel is saying, I can do that. I worship the living God. I have two-way conversations with God Almighty. If anybody knows what this dream is, God knows what the dream is. God knows what the dream is better than I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar remembers the dream. So Daniel 2.16. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would shew the king the interpretation. Now keep in mind, no one's told Daniel this dream either. And Daniel decides to show up and tell Nebuchadnezzar, all right, you don't want to tell us the dream. All right, you're the king. That's your right. I'm cool with that. But you also want to know what this dream means. Well, tell you what I can do. I'll go talk to God, and I'll ask God to tell me what you dreamed, and I'll ask him what it means. He gives me a good answer. I'll come back, and I'll talk to you about it, let you know what God says. So it goes. Now... Even just logically, at this point, if you're one of the Chaldeans or the magicians, if you're one of these dream interpreters, doesn't it sound like it was at least about time to go start guessing? It was like, okay, let me see. If we guess and we're wrong, we're executed. If we don't guess, we're executed. We may as well take a crack at it. But, you know, it says, I think, let's see, he had pepperoni pizza that night, so he probably, yeah, at least, guess, but you know, none of them did that. But Daniel basically says, I'll, I'll talk to God. Daniel had to tell the king what he dreamed. Now, that part was the king's real test. If you have supernatural power, as you claim, I expect you to use your clairvoyant abilities to be able to tell me what this dream was. Not just what it meant, but what it was. And the secret, then, had to be discovered from someone when the king was the only person who would know if you were right or wrong. Now, if the king's being vindictive, even if you get it right, he could still tell you you're wrong and still have you executed. He's the king. But then Daniel had to provide an interpretation of the dream. Now, once you know what the dream is, the interpretation is the easy part. 
And the reason the interpretation is the easy part is when you're dealing with symbolism, you can basically say anything means anything you want it to mean. You just have to have a good story to back it up. That's why Nebuchadnezzar's test was so strange. Now, when Daniel both knew the dream and gave the king an interpretation that astonished, or that astonished Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel got promoted. Daniel showed up and basically told him, I talked to God. Here's what God says. This is what you dreamed, and this is what it means. Nebuchadnezzar was pretty darn impressed. Now, we're not going to talk about what that dream was. That'd be you know, discussed very often in prophecy classes, because right now we're talking about Christmas. And so far, I can see that you can tell, obviously, where all this is going with Christmas, right? Daniel 2, 47, 48. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets. Seeing thou couldst reveal this secret, then the king made Daniel a great man, and gave him many great gifts, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Now we're getting a little bit closer to the Christmas story here. So the king answered unto Daniel, Of a truth it is, your God is a God of gods and the Lord of kings. And this is the part that impressed Nebuchadnezzar, and a revealer of secrets. Nobody knew what I dreamed. So you showed up and you told me what I dreamed. You revealed the secret that I had kept back to me. Where I was the only person who knew whether you were right or wrong, and you nailed it. And the result was, Daniel, the servant, the slave, the captive, who was a prisoner of war, not that long ago, is now made ruler over the whole province of Babylon. A role like that means he probably reported directly to the king. And chief of the governors over who? All the wise men of Babylon. All right, well, we're still 500 years before Christ. And Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, would later be replaced. So much later, Darius, the Persian, took control of Babylon. So now we have a change of administrations. You had the Babylonian kingdom, well, now they're gone. Now the Persians are in charge. When the Persians showed up, do you think they booted everybody out and installed their own people? Not quite. Darius had 120 rulers running things. And three top rulers over them all, and Daniel was his favorite and most trusted. So basically, the way things worked back then, everybody understood that from time to time you get a regime change. It's just the way it works. When there's a regime change... Most of the kings, when they conquer another territory, they understand, I'm taking control of the territory. I don't want to decimate the territory. I still want the farmers farming, so I, I'll basically leave the farmers there. And I still need things to be run, so I leave the bureaucracy there. And if they'll swear loyalty to the throne, then they can have their jobs. And that's not that big of a deal. It's when something is a potential military threat, when they're concerned about a rebellion, is when they dismantle the entire area. And that was part of the problem when they were dealing with Israel, is that Israel had been a perpetual problem. It had been a military threat. And so that's why all of Israel got taken captive, and then the land got given to other people, chunks of the land just got left barren, and all of these enemy people were then brought in to be servants, and that's how Daniel ends up being the ruler of the province of Babylon. Which tells you slavery worked a little bit differently back then. But Daniel 6.3 tells us, then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Now you want to break this out. Darius wasn't so much a king as he was an emperor. The basic difference between a king and an emperor, if you want to think about it in a very simple way, is kings run kingdoms, emperors run empires. Empires are typically consisted of multiple kingdoms. And a kingdom is basically an autonomous entity. That it is loosely governed by the larger empire. It's mostly governed more locally. 
Now, we do things similar to this even now in corporate America. That you'll have divisions, you'll have companies that are run by larger conglomerates, but the larger conglomerate doesn't dictate really any of the day-to-day -day runnings. You just have the broader policies, you're supposed to generate a profit for your headquarters, but for the most part, the president of your division runs your division all by himself, and that he has autonomy. Empires and kingdoms are very similar. That whoever gets put in charge of the, the kingdom part of Babylon runs Babylon, basically as Babylon's king, and then reports to the imperial court. So King Darius is probably more technically Emperor Darius. And so he's looking to make Daniel the king. Well, that creates a problem because some of the other leaders got jealous. You know, these 120, those three going, excuse me, this guy was taken captive out of Babylon, or captive to Babylon out of Israel, and now he's going to be the king? I don't think so. And so they go to Darius and they hatch a plot. So Darius uh, got suckered in by the leaders of the idea of like, well, you're a god. People shouldn't pray to anybody but you. And Darius goes, huh, well, that sounds pretty cool. I think I'll sign that order. Well, Daniel keeps praying to God. And then they show up and say, oh, Daniel broke the law. He needs to be thrown in the lion's den. And Darius goes, oh, man, I should have signed that stupid law. It happens when ego takes control. And so then we have the whole Daniel in the lion's den story, which is, of course, a sermon unto itself. But Daniel came through the lion's den, and he was evidently left in charge of Babylon and the wise men. So after he went through his testing with Nebuchadnezzar, got proven with Nebuchadnezzar, now he gets proven with King Darius. So first he was in charge of the Babylonian wise men, now he's in charge of the Persian wise men, which are basically exactly the same people. It's the same order. And in charge of these wise men, in charge of the Magi, in Daniel 9, he was given the prophecy of 70 weeks by Gabriel. So Daniel, who is in charge of this order of magicians, astrologers, dream interpreters, he's their leader. He gets this prophecy that he's been praying. Gabriel shows up, tells him, would have been here earlier, but uh, I got delayed. Uh, Michael showed up to help out with the fight so I could come here and talk to you. So it's pretty significant here. And of key importance in the prophecy of 70 weeks is Daniel chapter 9, 25, 26. So we're almost to Christmas now. We've got to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel 9, 25, and 26 reads, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, Unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come or shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Well, that's actually Christmas. We're beginning to talk about Christmas. Know therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild, or restore and build Jerusalem. Because right now, Jerusalem is in ruins. The wall's knocked down. The temple has been destroyed. Basically, there is no Jerusalem. It is the ghost town. It's a place on a map that used to be someplace important. And that the Messiah, the prince, is going to show up. That there's going to be this ruler. And he's going to get cut off. Okay, well, the cut off part, now we're talking Easter. So there's stuff going on in here that Gabriel tells... Daniel. But the most interesting part of it is he's given a timetable. That a week, you know, we think of a week as just a week of days, seven days, but there's also a, a Hebraic construct of a week of years. It's seven years. That things happen in seven day cycles, things also happen in seven year cycles. And so talking about these 69 weeks is 69 sets of seven weeks. The command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was evidently given by uh, King Artaxerxes 
on, on, for the Gregorian calendar going backwards, on March 14th, 445 B.C. So that's on our calendar. That, that wasn't their calendar. They go, it's like, oh, what day is it? March 14th, 445 B.C., sir. Like, okay, what does the B.C. stand for? Like, oh, be before Christ, don't worry about it. Lord. Now, but on our calendar, 445 B.C., March 14th, that order was given. Now, if you count 69 weeks worth of years, based upon the old 360-day calendar, that would be 173,880 days. Now, imagine Gabriel showing up and says, Okay, Daniel, this event's going to happen in the future. At some point, some king who has the authority to make this order is going to order Jerusalem rebuilt. Start counting from that day 173,880 days later, the Messiah, the king, is going to be presented to Israel. Now, if you were Daniel, might you be a little bit inspired to sit down and say, okay, guys, 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 okay, break out all the calendars, okay, I, we need to work it out like five, six hundred years, start counting. Because if you count that number of days from that order, it lands you on April 6th, 32 A.D. on the Gregorian calendar. And that is a probable date of the triumphal entry by Jesus. The triumphal entry is curiously the first and only time Jesus showed up publicly proclaiming himself as king. We're told several times before they wanted to make him king, and he says no. They wanted to take him to be king by force. And he just sort of vanishes into the crowd. But this time, he sets it up. He sets up the whole donkey thing. He sets up where they're going to go. He doesn't even come into town until he can ride into town. Never did that before. People are beginning to praise him. Think of how many times, if you read the Gospels, he tells people not to say anything about who he is. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. Consistently followed up with a, shh, but don't tell anybody yet. Don't tell anybody yet. Later we're going to tell, tell people about this. So this is an unusual event. That's a one-time deal. And as the people are laying down palms for Palm Sunday, as they're praising Hosanna, blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord, and uh, the Jewish rulers are saying, no, 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 you can't let them do that. That's blasphemous. You just tell them to be quiet. Jeez, come on. And that's when Jesus said, if they were silent, even the rocks would cry out. Now, I don't know about you guys. I'd be one of the ones in the crowd. Whoa, 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 whoa. Shh, shh, I want to hear the rocks. Shh, shh, darn, you guys won't be quiet. I want to hear the rocks. Uh, Chuck Missler says that whenever he takes people there, he always tells them to pick up one of the, the little stones to keep it as a souvenir. I, I don't know if they allow you to, to do that these days, but back in the day, he says that he has one of those and he has it mounted up on a plaque. And he says, that's one of the rocks that didn't cry out. Because you've gotten everybody else to be quiet, that's one of the rocks that would have cried out. Now, if Daniel sat down with the mathematicians of his day and he counted, they might have been able to count 178,880 days, right? They might have been able to figure out the date on their calendar and figure out about when this presentation of the king was going to have to occur, right? Well, that'd be a little less than 500 years. 500 years! Now imagine, you sit there and you figure this thing out that's going to happen 500 years from now. What do you do with that? You're not going to see it. But it just so happens you run an order of magi whose job is prophecy. To use astrology to tell the future. And if you study the stars enough so you can determine the march of stars, has anyone ever seen, even today, that the people who still do astrology can publish books telling you your horoscope for every single day for the whole rest of the year, of every single astrological sign. Well, if you know where the stars are going to be, and it's the position of the stars and the position of the planets that are going to tell you what your horoscope is for the day, how far in advance could you give someone their horoscope? 
as far in advance as you could tell where the stars are going to be. That's why they studied the stars. As, astronomy was born out of astrology that, that had a social significance for astrological uses. And so basically, the science part of astrology was astronomy. And we thought, well, you guys did a good job with this part. We're going to keep this part. Not so sure we buy the rest of that. But, you know, you know where all the stars are. You know where all the planets are. That part was cool. So we're going to hang on to that. So these people did think long term. They think in terms of movements of planets. They think in terms of movements of stars. They think in terms of seasons. They think in terms of years. And because they also deal with regimes and they deal with, you know, old times and new times and future times, Daniel's prophecy dealt with centuries to come. So for Daniel, this 500-year deal, that's not that unusual for him. Now, in order for the king of the Jews to show up, what has to happen before 500 years from now, this guy can show up? He's got to be born. So it would not have been hard to figure out that there's a fairly small historical window in which that might happen. That the presentation of the king, what is the youngest age the king could be presented to Israel? The youngest age. Born, right? It's a boy! Yay! Praise the king of Israel! What's the oldest? Not dead. They are. Right. You figure, you're looking at what? To, to legitimately be a king and to rule afterwards for there to be something going on here. And then he has to be cut off. You go, okay, so he's going to show up and be king, but then he's going to get cut off. That sounds like he might be dead. It's like, okay, so not dead. So he shows up, I'm king! <laughs> A2, Brute? But, so, that still gives you a fairly narrow window. 50 years, maybe? Plus or minus? And so they know, okay, this happens here. So somewhere between this date, somewhere between April 6, 32 AD, and some decades before that, he's got to be born. And so what's the deal going to be? Now, one of the interesting things in here, and it's not in your notes to consider, and don't know if Daniel would have known this or not, but the one to be born a king, to be born to the throne, what do you have to have to be born to the throne? You have to have the lawful access as a member of the royal family. Otherwise, you're not born the king. You could be named the king. You could become the king. But in order to be born the king of the Jews, you have to be the son of the current king. Or the grandson of the current king. You have to be in that royal lineage. Well, part of the problem is the royal lineage has had a blood curse put on it by God. It's been taken captive by Babylon. The kingdom is gone. There is no kingdom anymore. You might still have the royal blood line going on, but they don't sit on the throne anymore. And God's declared a blood curse on the royal line of David. Now what are you going to do? Now as these prophecies were probably capped about the king of the Jews was going to show up, even for Daniel, he's probably got to be wondering, say, okay, so does that mean we get our throne back? Hundreds of years would pass. And Israel would never be a fully and completely autonomous kingdom again. And there's a blood curse on the throne. And no king of the bloodline would ever prosper on the throne. And yet we still have this prophecy. And we have a timetable. So now let's jump up to Matthew 2, 1 through 3. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For 400 years, the Jews hadn't heard from God. For 400 years, there isn't a prophet. For 400 years, God is essentially silent. There were revolutions, there were people standing up doing things on behalf of God. The Maccabean Revolution is what gave birth to Hanukkah, the Festival of Lights, and that there was a miracle that took place in that time. But we have this period of silence, and from a century before that, Daniel. And these magi, this order, had to be watching Israel and going, you know, 
it don't look like it's going so well for them. They don't have a kingdom. They, they get conquered by one group or another group. Just, you know, we've conquered them. The Romans conquered them. We conquered them again. The Romans took it back. Egypt showed up a couple of times. You know, they're kind of at this crossroads place where they might not have all the natural resources someone would want to take just to control them, but you know, that's kind of a crux where everything kind of runs through their territory, and, and they're just really not in a good situation there. But the Magi had been waiting. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? But we have seen his star in the east. And are come, now here's an interesting thing, to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Because Herod was the king of the Jews. Legally, appointed by Caesar. If this kid was born the king of the Jews, and he was so significant, so important, not only would the Jews acknowledge him as their king, even the Persians would acknowledge this kid as the king of the Jews. Herod knew he was in trouble. And so that's why when Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Because if these Persian magi were coming to worship this kid, there's something going on here. And the Romans and the Persians were enemies. Herod had been having problems with unrest in his territory as it was. And if the Persians are going to show up and offer financial and military support to the next uprising led by this kid, Herod knows he's not going to survive that. He knows he's in trouble. So, of course, what does he want to do? He wants to get rid of the kid. So he tells him, oh, let me help you out here. Okay. Scholar guys, where, where is this kid born? Bethlehem? Okay. Go to Bethlehem and find him and come back and tell him. Because you know, I, I want to come worship him too. I do. Really, really. No, trust me. I do. And the Magi said, okay, whatever. And they head off to Jerusalem. So they get their directions of, to, to Bethlehem. So they head off to Bethlehem. And then they were led to a particular house by the star. Now think about that for a second. We're in the east. We see his star. The king of the Jews is born. Should be about now. There's a star. Let's go. They know when it is because they see the star. They show up in Jerusalem and they can't find the town. So the star doesn't tell them what town to go to. So they have to go to King Herod to say, can you give us directions? Now you know these were wise men because they stopped to ask for directions. And so they have to get directions to Bethlehem. But then once they get to Bethlehem, the star leads them to the exact house. Now, does that sound like you're talking about literal stars, glowing gas balls in the heavens? If it can lead you to the exact house, probably not. It's probably some sort of a supernatural thing going on here. Might still be a star. It might just be that they needed to have their bearings. That they could tell exactly which direction to go if they had their starting point. But they just didn't know which town they had to go to. And that Dan, whatever information Daniel left for them told him, you see the star, you need to go find out where he's at. Once you find the town, then here's how you figure out exactly which house to go to. But then here gets to be a key part. And this is part of what tells you who these people are. Most people assume that because they came when they saw a star, that they're astrologers. They see this unusual celestial event, they figure, well, something important must be happening, let's go check it out. And so they just head off. But that kind of undertaking is a huge thing for the order of the Magi to launch such an expedition into Roman territory was a huge deal. It's not just three guys saddle up their camels and head off. There'd be a whole entourage here, and we don't know how many wise men there were. So it might have been a huge contingent of wise men, plus servants, plus supplies, and plus protection, because they are going into enemy territory. And so they would very likely have enough military protection so they couldn't just be taken captive, so they could defend themselves. Herod would likely have considered them a threat. But knowing, okay, you know, I'll mobilize my people, and they already have their people coming, is there going to be a fight? Because they don't have enough people to be picking a fight. 
I don't want to attack them first because if they're not showing up to pick a fight, I don't want to be the one that has to tell Caesar that, yeah, we're back at war with Persia because I killed the wrong guy. I mean, Herod's got a tough position. And so he, he's had some problems in the past. Pilate had had some problems in the past, too. But being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. They were dream interpreters. They were accustomed to being communicated to in dreams. And they were so accustomed to being interpreting dreams and being communicated with in dreams that even though they had this deal with Herod, when they have this dream, that they shouldn't go back to Herod. Then they don't go back to Herod. And they departed into their own country another way. So that's A, how powerful these dreams are, and how seriously these people took their dreams. That they would break a deal with a king on the basis of a dream. Now that's part of what tells us, yes, this is the same order of Magi. That there was a 500 year continuity from Daniel and his leadership of the wise men to these wise men. So consider this likelihood. That the Magi were from the same order that Daniel led under both the Babylonian and the Persian rulers. That Daniel's order of Magi survived regime change from the Babylonians to the Persians. So the east of Israel was Persia. So the Magi come from the east, the wise men from the east. If the Magi were from the order of the Magi in Persia, then they might have had all of Daniel's original prophecies. Because Daniel was the one that knew what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed. Daniel was the one that could interpret the handwriting on the wall. Daniel was the one that survived the lion's den. You can imagine, Daniel would be a legendary figure in the order of the Magi. And the Bible includes the prophecy of Daniel. Now, if the Bible includes the prophecy of Daniel, and the order of the Magi would review Daniel as like the ultimate legendary figure who maintained the integrity of the order of the Magi through regime change from the Babylonians to the Persians, who was the you know, favored ruler under Darius, who was favored under Nebuchadnezzar, would it make sense that they would have kept a copy of Daniel's books? And because these people take these kind of prophecies very seriously, if their own legendary figure says, in 178,880 days, something significant is going to happen, you need to be paying attention for it. And that when that happens, go find the kid. Go visit him. He's going to need some stuff. There's a deal going on here. I believe that Daniel knew what was going on. He knew what was going to happen. He knew about when it was going to happen. Because he knows in 178,880 days, the king is presented. So somewhere between 178,880 days and some number of years before that, he's going to be born. Now, because these wise men show up with certain items, there's significance to this too. And we'll get to that in just a moment. The Persians and the Romans were military enemies. They periodically fought. I mean, they weren't in a constant state of war, but they were enemies. Israel was a Roman territory at this time, but it was not solidly held. And Israel had changed hands several times in the last 400 years. But it does appear that Daniel knew, and the people of the order of wise men he once led kept the prophecies of Daniel, and they looked for a sign of the birth of the anointed one. God talked to them through dreams, which tells us they were probably more dream interpreters than just astrologers. But think about this. Gentiles, for five centuries, looked forward to Christmas. Now this is significant. They bring the first Christmas presents. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, these aren't just expensive things that come take the king to curry favor. I mean, they're presenting it before a baby. And they knew, I mean, you, you didn't need to be really terribly educated at that time to know that the throne of Israel had been unoccupied for centuries. And so they show up 
to this little house in Bethlehem. They don't expect to find him in a throne room, even though they know, well, if he's born the king of the Jews, his father legally would have to have the right to the throne. But for centuries, there's been no throne to have a right to. They might even have figured out at this point, if they were keeping up on the Jewish prophets and they were collecting the Jewish prophets, trying to track this prophecy as, you know, the Hebraic specialist in their Jewish studies department of the Order of the Magi. So now it's like, oh, look, we, f- we found this blood curse. I wonder how that's going to work. That's going to have to be something pretty interesting. But they show up to worship him. And here's the interesting thing. Gold is a traditional gift for a king. You bring gold to present to a king. If someone is born to be a king and you want to pay respect, you would show up with a gift of gold. That's how you acknowledge somebody's kingship. Frankincense, though, that was the traditional symbolic gift for a priest. So you would take gold to a king, frankincense to a priest, of the, the incense to be burned for prayers. And so there was symbolism there. But myrrh, myrrh was the odd one. The burial spice. Why would you take a burial spice to a baby shower? I mean, basically, you're doing roughly the equivalent of saying, okay, your baby's just been born. I want to tell you, I bought you a coffin. <laughs> for your baby. And you're like, okay, you know, they know something. But here's the part of the thing. Daniel knew. He was told the Messiah would be cut off. Something was going to happen. And cut off and not for himself. That's the Easter story. But gold, he's being acknowledged as the king. Frankincense, he's being acknowledged as a priest. Kings and priests were not the same people in Israel. That you had the civil rulers, the secular rulers, and then you had the religious leaders. The priesthood and the kingship were two completely separate things. Now, for the Babylonians, for the Persians later, they were very often the same thing. But the king was also the high priest. You had the whole thing of the god kings, even going all the way back to Egypt. Even later on, we would uh, take a page of that, and you know, when Henry uh, organized the Church of England, he was both the king and the head of the Church of England. But these roles in Israel had never been merged before. You were a king or you were a priest, and the wise men show up to acknowledge him as both king and priest at birth, that he was born the king of the Jews. He was also born a priest. Priests were of the tribe of Levi. Jesus wasn't of the tribe of Levi. He was of the tribe of Judah. But David was Judah, not Levi. If he's the heir to the throne, but he's also heir to the high priesthood. We're told later on it's by the order of Melchizedek rather than from the order of Levi. And the burial spice myrrh for the Savior who is about to die. That there's going to be some bad things going on here. And that this baby was born in order to die. Not in the same sense for the rest of us. The wise men knew there was something up. And they knew on day 178,880, he would be presented as a king, and sometime shortly after that, he would die. That Christmas was a story that God started writing in the beginning. He started revealing it in the Garden of Eden. And now we can see that we had an order of wise men, an order of the Magi, Daniel's Magi, waiting for five centuries, counting the days, waiting for the signs, ready to present him with the gift of a king, the gift of a priest and the gift of a savior who would be cut off, but not for himself. To bring the very first Christmas presents. And now, another 2,000 years later, wise men still seek him.